Hi, everyone. <coughs> Welcome and thank you for joining Wild China's. This is our 59th event. Um, my name is Zhang Mei and founder of Wild China. And as some of you uh, who follow some of our programs, you know, we do a monthly book talk. And this month, February, we read this book, The Great Wall in 50 Objects. And, and I'm super excited. We have uh, my dear friend, Willem Lindsay, joining us from cold, cold Beijing. And he will give us a, a private uh, talk and private glimpse of his collection, uh, which is behind him. You will see Willem's already on the screen. And of course, he'll tell us his stories and the conservation efforts of the Great Wall. Now, if you haven't read the book yet, I highly encourage you to buy it. Amazon has it. It's great for the in-depth understanding of the Great Wall, or sometimes merely dipping in for a little bit to history tidbits. It's fantastic because each story um, is, is uh, a complete story on its own. So, but before we start, I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the background on William. If you're based in China uh, and know and has any interest in the Great Wall, William Lindsay doesn't require any introduction. I think everyone, every single person I know in Beijing knows you, William. And if you're not based in China but have done any research about the Great Wall and conservation in China, 99% uh, of the time you've probably come across his name. Uh, it's safe to say William is one of the world's leading, leading expert. Um, on Great Wall and a very uh, strong, dedicated conservation voice uh, for the Great Wall of China. Now, William is a geographer who first was drawn to the Great Wall by his passion for cross-country running. He's a marathon runner like me. No, no, Kendra, my colleague wrote this, cross-country marathon not like me, not like me. Okay, I am a marathon tourist who hovers around for our finish. And Willem Lindsay is two hour 39 minutes. That's a completely, completely different, different league. Um, what that means is a five, less than five minute per mile continuing for 26 miles. I don't think I can ever imagine doing that um, but and anyway, back to, back to the Great Wall. In 1987, William became the first foreigner to, to make the 2,470 kilometer journey on foot along the Great Wall. And since then, his passion for the Great Wall has really continued and he set up his uh, permanent home at the foot of the Great Wall uh, with his wife and two children, uh, no longer children, but uh, adults. 20 and 28 right? yeah. years old. Um, anyway, his contribution to the conservation of Great Wall and also Sino-UK relations has really earned him a tremendous amount of international and well-deserved recognition. He received the Friendship Award, um, I think the medal personally from uh, Premier Zhu Rongji in 1998. And he was also made an officer of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth the second for his service to UK-China relations and the wall conservation. William has published five books, including this one, which we are reading. And uh, of course, he writes extensively for National Geographic and various um, esteemed media. And this book tells the story of the Great Wall by breaking down into individual objects. Now, I imagine the process of researching, curating, and telling the story is probably just like preparing for an endurance sport, an endurance race. It's a feat not possible without meticulous planning and perfect execution. So I can't wait to, to hear more, a bit on logistics. So William will take about 20 minutes or so and give us a um, a, a talk about the Great Wall himself, and then we head into the Q&A section. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Willem. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks, May, and thanks for reminding me of my faster running days. Amazing. <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> um, 
the the Great Wall in 50 Objects project was a really fun and new project. Um, a few years ago, a young boy whose father told him, William has been doing things at the Great Wall for 30 years. And the boy said, well, how can you just study a wall for 30 years? And um, I stopped for a few seconds and I replied, well, you look at it differently every time. <clears throat> yes. First um, journey along the wall was on foot. That was a big adventure. I knew nothing about China. Um, I could only speak a, uh, a few sentences. Um, but I really discovered that the Great Wall was a phenomenal landscape um, because, you know, I came to China knowing very little about China's history, but I was a geographer, so I, I was most impressed by the landscape. Um, and in fact, I grew to learn that, of course, all history begins with geography, begins with the land, the quality of the land, whether the land is productive or difficult to survive on. And then the people living on those lands, they either live in deficits of things or they produce surpluses. And I got to learn that that was basically a summary of the conflict between the nomadic people of Northeast Asia and the sedentary settled people to their south. In other words, the Chinese. And because of this difference in land, difference in economy, difference in lifestyle, difference in wealth, uh, conflict broke out. And um, uh, that's really how uh, the geographer uh, became a bit of an historian. And of course, because the primary source of studying the war are the ruins of the war strewn across many provinces of China, I became a bit of an archeologist. And, um, you know, as I stood on the wall, I realized that mm, the wall is not just a Chinese so story, it's a two-sided story because, you know, without an enemy, there was, would be no need to defend with the construction of a wall. And then, you know, being a foreigner and during the vacations, traveling um, uh, to various countries, occasionally I would see an object or a document or a map in a museum or a gallery in uh, the Vatican or London or Washington DC. And I think I can make a connection between that and the Great Wall. So it was about uh, 20, 2013, 14, around this time, I had written uh, a couple of pieces for the Chinese language edition of National Geographic magazine. And um, apparently the editor of international editions in, in Washington DC was very intrigued that the Chinese edition of National Geographic uh, printed stories about the wall written by a foreigner. But these were very different stories, very different stories. You know, we're always talking about the Great Wall of China. My stories were about the Great Wall outside China. Because, you know, when you go back in history, there were no absolute borders. So when you're studying the Great Wall, this is the first thing you're going to do is strip away the borders and look at this chunk of Asia as a whole. And as I saw a modern day map of Mongolia, I noticed, you know, this classic battleman like symbol for a wall. Mongolia. And I asked myself the question, hey, how can there be these long walls in Mongolia anyway? I went there and I had some great expeditions and I wrote about these expeditions in that Geo Chinese edition. And the, 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 uh, the manager of the international edition, she asked the commissioning editor in Beijing, 
does William have any other Great Wall ideas up his sleeve? And I was, you know, thrilled to be asked this question. And my reply was, well, do you know what? For years, I've been seeing these objects, documents, photographs, beside the wall in China, in Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, in these cities in Europe. And I'd like to kind of curate a bunch of these to tell an off the Great Wall, Great Wall story. And I thought, you know, the editor would say, oh, well, you know, that's a bit too big and this kind of thing. And said, that's a great idea. How would you roll out the story? Would it be a few features? And I said, and I said, actually, ideally, if I could introduce two objects per month for two years and cover 50 objects related to the Great War, I think that would be about right. And you know what? They said yes. So I was absolutely delighted. And, you know, I had like this pattern in my mind, very rough of all these things. And then, you know, in two months time, I had to deliver the story, the first story and the plan for two years. And in fact, um, when I wrote down a list, I thought there were like really scores of objects, scores of documents and maps. But when I write, wrote down the list, I had about 35. But still, I, I sent in the list of 35 and the editor said, well, what about the 15? And I said, well, you know, like a proper traveler, always space in the baggage to learn from the unexpected. OK, so. Uh, Without further ado, I'd like to show you a few objects that I have in my collection, because among the 50, I think 10 were from this room. And you'll notice behind me, I, I hope the clarity of the picture is good enough. There are a lot of maps, a lot of maps, because I'm a geographer, remember. And also because maps were the first images in Westerners' eyes of the Great War. Before photographs, of course, before drawings, even before anything written, the first evidence of the Great Wall in China, in Europe, was an image on the map. I have one of those maps here with me, and suddenly I'm going to disappear as I hold this huge thing in front of, in front of you. And you may be thinking, well, like most old maps, it looks like nowhere. <laughs> and that's because it should be viewed this way. Oh, which is upside down. OK, so let's go this way. Yeah. OK, hopefully you can you can see some land here. The yellow colored area is China. That's the one. Yeah, and this is the ocean here, and this is the Malay Peninsula, the Philippines. And up here is the first image of the Great Wall, and it dates from 1584. 1584. I'll put this one down. And that map is extracted from a huge atlas considered to be the first world atlas published in Antwerp in 1584. And it was the creation of this man, Abraham Ortelius. Now, the, the uh, emergence of the Great Wall in the minds of foreigners on the far side of the world began with that map. <clears throat> and when I, <clears throat> when I hold that map, excuse me, <clears throat> When I hold that map, I ask myself, 430, 40 years ago, when someone was looking at that map, could they possibly believe it? You know, and there's an annotation on the map in Latin, which says that wall is 400 leagues. That's 1,200 English miles in length. Just imagine someone in England, for example, around 1600, thinking about that. They knew of the Roman wall of Hadrian, which was 80 miles in length, but that 
on that map was 15 times longer. The point I'm trying to make is that at the time, that world atlas had all kinds of unbelievable mythical things on the various maps of regions of the world. And the users were new to these things. They had never seen volcanoes erupting. They had never seen these huge mammals, uh, whales in, in the ocean. And they had never seen or heard of a wall that you know, was over a thousand miles long. So I think it's very interesting, you know, the, the, the thoughts of the people at the time. Okay, well, that's, <clears throat> that's, um, that's the beginning. Now, you know, I don't know who's been to the wall, who's watching, but when you go to the wall, you're usually struck by its beauty. It's beauty. It's a beautiful combination of an ancient building and mountainsides, sometimes rocky, sometimes forested, depending on the time of year, green, covered in blossom, covered in snow. And it's hard to believe that 500 years before, this was a war zone. But in fact, there are a few examples of, you know, evidence if you lose your way. So I'd like to tell you <clears throat> the story of this. Okay. You can see it's a huge chunk of rock. And when I show this to students, I say, this is a weapon. What age do you think it's from? And of course, everyone shouts out, oh, it's a Stone Age weapon, because it's a big stone. It's, they think it's a stone for throwing off the wall. But no, it's a stone that's been made. Yeah. And it's basically a container for housing an explosion. So here we go high tech. And, you know, I've been in China for 30 years. And when I, you know, when returned to my country of origin, say in the 90s, you know, China was quite undeveloped then and thought to be backward. And I would say to my friends and family, Actually, in China's history, for most of China's history, China was extremely advanced. Lots of inventions came from China. So this uh, artifact is an example of that. It looks, you know, stone age and clumsy, but it contained gunpowder, which was one of the four great Chinese inventions. In fact, there is a chemical manual detailing the composition of gunpowder, and it dates from the 11th century. This weapon I'm holding here dates from the 1570s. We know that because there was a famous commander of the Great Wall close to the city of Beijing who wrote uh, a manual called um, uh, Records of Military Training. His name was Qi Jiguang, Commander Qi Jiguang. And in that manual, he describes this weapon, purpose made in the mountains where there's plenty of rock, made by men who have some time on their hands to use a hammer and chisel. And they use those tools to make a rock this shape and they hollow it out so they can pack it with gunpowder and bury it where the enemy is likely to pass. So it gets even more high tech when you think these were buried in front of the wall, perhaps a hundred yards in front and detonated automatically by the passage of the enemy breaking a wire or a string. And that set in motion a weight 
which was attached to a string wound round a, a, an axle. And the weight fell into a pit, rotated the axle, and on the axle there was a steel disc that ground on flint, creating a spark to ignite the gunpowder. It sounds very complicated, but it is described meticulously in Qi Ji Guang's manual. And it really shows you how advanced warfare was uh, nearly 500 years ago. And it's a stark reminder that the Great War was not built by the Chinese to boost tourism. It was a defense against an enemy. And that leads us on to the next object, um, the question being, China has always been a large country with a large number of people because they had good land and they were very well organized in their food production. Uh, and they produced more food than they could consume and they stored surpluses. So they had a very organized society because of the land. But uh, you only have to go a thousand miles north of uh, today's Beijing and you are on the Mongolian steppe. And it's a completely different world there. If you look at China and Mongolia today, China has 1.4 billion people. Mongolia has about 4 million people. Yeah. And that's because the land is difficult to live on. It's a harsh climate. The summers can be very hot and they can bring droughts and the winters are usually severely cold. Um, the growing season is very short up there. So people could only survive by raising animals. But in a drought or an extremely cold winter, um, those kind of events can kill animals. And it's these kind of events, we believe, triggered the first forays, attacks, which eventually would become invasions by nomadic people towards the south, trespassing on Chinese land. And although only a few of them came initially, they were formidable warriors doing something that the Chinese had not encountered before. They were riding horses and using the bow and arrow very skillfully from the back of a galloping horse. So they were the world's first cavalry. So that this is why I included the Mongolian composite bow in my 50 objects. And it's impossible to give you an appreciation of the, the scale of this weapon, but it's incredibly long. This is the uh, this is the top, the horse head, and the body of the bow is composed of ibex horn and birch wood, and that's the tail of the bow, a horse tail. And you can see here, there's all kinds of materials. These are deer tendons, and the whole thing is glued together with fish skin glue. So that's why it's called a composite bow. And it's extremely flexible, extremely strong. You know, when you're a kid, you go into the woods, you find a, a, a stick and you take it home, you make a bow and it's great for about three shots and then it breaks in the middle. Well, this didn't. That's the, that's the great, you know, construction advancement brought by this bow. Um, anyway, to talk about, you know, having spare room in your baggage for the unexpected, I was in Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, in the National Museum, uh, speaking with the curator, and uh, they were fantastic. They got, you know, a, a, a 12th century bow out of the case for me. They got armour from the Genghis Khan period from the display cases arrowheads and I said to the curator well thank you so much for your help I've it's been a real harvest for me here I think I've done everything 
and he said to me, have you done the horse? And I said, horse? But a horse is an animal. He said, yes, but without the horse, we nomadic people did not have the transportation to make such a long journey from the steppe land south, crossing the Gobi, to get to China, to get what we needed to survive. And of course, I knew this, but it's only his comment made me realize that the horse was central to the Great War story. So I included it as one of the 50 objects. And I think uh, readers will discover within the book there are about seven or eight horse-related objects in the book. Uh, stirrups, for example, uh, because, you know, that gave the nomadic war stability uh, when they're using the bow from a galloping horse. Um, and also there's a scroll um, showing the presentation of horses as a gift from nomadic people to the Chinese court. And uh, that, that uh, particular object uh, was in the Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian Museum in DC. And, you know, I'd seen so many similar scrolls, you know, the, the outsiders presenting the Chinese with horses. And I thought that would be just like getting a pair of socks again. What's so special about horses? And it set me off on this investigation. Why were horses such a welcome gift? And they were such a welcome gift because there were no horses uh, to compare with those that were born and grew um, uh, eating the, the grass Mongolian steppe. Um, uh, so those, those were extremely strong, healthy horses. When the Chinese tried to breed horses like that themselves, they found all kinds of uh, uh, defects and difficulties because, you know, the horses were away from that ideal, perfect habitat. So, yeah, the, the, this, that's really a, an example of what an eye-opener of the journey the 50 Objects Project was for me because it takes you on these side streets leading off from the wall into areas of, you know, not just Chinese history, but... Asian history that you're you're not familiar with um, so that that was great okay so that's now maybe the the viewers are, are, are wondering is that a, a, a Mongolian composite bow from the Genghis Khan period no um, these kind of objects preserved well because they're made of organic materials that rot but this is made by one of only two surviving traditional bow makers left in the whole of Mongolia. Um, and it's made uh, of all original materials. So it really is a, like a, a living fossil. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just put this down safely. And now I'd like to um, give you an example of another foreign object, okay? There we go. Now, hope, hopefully you can see that. The Great Wall of China by That's Guile. Your predecessor. Uh, yes, William Edgar Guile. And this is, um, well, it's my most book uh, in my collection because it's the first book in any country, and I always say, including China, because, you know, Chinese people think, oh, there must be a great book about the Great Wall written, you know, in such a dynasty. No, this is the first dedicated book on the Great Wall of China on the planet. And it was written by someone who was born in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. William Guile became fascinated with China, and in 1908, he made the first journey along the Great Wall of China. Uh, and we know that because he documented in this book and he illustrated his journey uh, with uh, scores of photographs of, uh, of the wall. 
Um, and he really showed the world the diversity of the Gaul's architecture and the variety of landscapes it crossed. And I met William Guile in a very personal way, uh, although he died in 1925. His book was gifted to me when I published my book, detailing my adventure journey, um, which came out in 1989. So it's from, you know, holding the, the, the two Great Wall of China books by the two Williams, William Lindsay and William Guile, that led me to see that the Great Wall that William Guile had seen 80 years before me was a younger and more complete, better preserved wall. Because 20th century, there, were, uh, there was a succession of events that impacted on the wall's um, uh, well-being. Uh, war, revolution, lack of any uh, uh, protection regulations, and so on. Um, perhaps, you know, I, I, I went to scores of places William Guile took his photographs at and re-photographed them. Uh, and that was a very moving um, thing to do because, for example, here, I found the location of, of this, this embossed image on the cover. This tower and the adjacent towers, they're all gone, which was very heartbreaking. But that was the purpose of the journey, really, to give the then and now and white simple evidence that didn't need any words and put it in front of the Chinese people to say, this is how the Great Wall has changed in the, in, in the 20th century. And really to ask the question, what's going to happen in the 21st century? If, you, if, if your economy just steams ahead, thinking about the future, more of the past will be lost. And the work did its job and was very well received uh, in China. Um, there were two national exhibitions in Beijing. There's been exhibitions along the wall uh, in the East End in Shanghai Guan, in the West End in Jiayi Guan. And uh, it really awoke the nation also into seeing the value of old photographs to show so many things that had disappeared. Because if you look at any foreigners' accounts uh, of their travels in China before 1920, every town they got to had a wall around it. Every town had temples with large pine trees. And, you know, of course, the foreigners had never seen these things before, and they photographed it all. So the foreign resource on China in this respect is a very great one. And what's absolutely remarkable about William Gale is, do you know what? He was born on October the 1st in 1865. And of course, October the 1st is considered to be the birthday of the People's Republic of China. So I presented his book and his photographs as a gift to China um, to you know, speak for the silent stones. Uh, that the Great Wall were for so long. Now the nation's consciousness has been awoken and uh, the future of the Great Wall is looking much, much brighter because you know, there's been a national survey. The, the wall has been found to be you know, thousands of kilometers long and, and uh, it really is uh, receiving much more uh, conservation uh, attention, which is, which is great. Good. So um, I think my uh, 20 minutes or so is probably up. Um, and I've, I've spoken quite a bit about uh, a few objects, one found right beside the wall, one that originates from the other side of the world. Uh, and of course, the earliest view that foreigners were given of the Great Wall with the Ortelius map. 
So I guess now um, we can we can discuss the project, the book, or some objects yeah. as as you as you wish. Thank you, William. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. You're welcome. I think you've really given a voice to these silent objects. You know, but when people think about archaeology, all these dead objects are just sitting alone in a in a on the shelf or on the wall or in a case. You, you've done an incredible job of giving them a voice. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Now. Uh, my my first question, there are a couple of very good questions from the audience already, but uh, this one, I was particularly struck when I read your book. It says, the placement of an artifact behind glass deprives it of personality. And it's interesting, if you're looking at wall, you're constantly looking at the wall, and I'm looking at uh, travel and I look at tour guides, so I see guiding all the time. And what I saw, I wrote down in my own notes. I said the process of standardized guide license exam robs the guides of personality, borrowing what you said about the objects conservation. And so I want to explore your thinking on this a little bit. I, I would love to hear you expand on that. What do you mean by that? If these objects do not go to museums. Uh, or the Great Wall do not get renovated into a tourist site, which is a standardization that sort of takes away part of their personality. What are the other ways that could bring personality to the conservation? Mm. Yeah, that's a good and complicated question. But first of all, on the objects behind the glass in the cases, so many of my objects, were like that. Yeah. Um, for example, in the Jiayuan Great Wall Museum, there was a piece of wood dating from the Han Dynasty, 2,100 years old, an important object for studying the Great Wall. <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? Uh, and um, I, I, I discovered that often there was the assumption that the viewer was spending you know, a very short time in the museum and there wasn't time to tell them the full story of that object. But um, I think there are people who like to get down to the details. Um, that particular object, by the way, was, it was akin to a notebook with miscellaneous jottings but it was a notebook used by a bunch of soldiers who manned and lived at a watchtower on the Northwest frontier 2,100 years ago. Wow. And at this time, uh, communication was becoming more important. The Great War, whether we talk of the oldest wall from more than 2,300 years ago to the most recent Great Wall, which, you know, is the Great Wall I'm going to see when I visit China. All of these walls had multiple functions. First function, a defense against the warriors on their horses. Second function, a signaling line. And if you're going to signal, that is information. And how is the information going to be conveyed? It could be visual, smoke, flag. It could be audible, uh, drum beats, or it could be written. So in the Hanasty, written communication along the wall became increasingly important because the signaling codes detailing, oh, the enemy is a hundred warriors strong or a thousand strong. So details had to be conveyed. And the only way and the best way to do that was using the Chinese written language. But in those days, the average soldier was illiterate. They had to learn how to write. So this piece of wood was a piece of wood on which soldiers were learning how to write. 
they just copied something random from a military circular or more appropriately linear that was passed along the wall and they copied it out and then maybe another one would get a knife and shave off of the wood and then you know a bit like using an eraser and then use a little brush to write the Chinese characters and I was determined to find out what this piece of wood was used for and I found that well I believe that to be the answer okay uh, now to uh, the uh, the preservation of the wall, and you mentioned, you know, renovated Great Wall. Um, you know, you you run Wild China. Uh, my my brand name is Wild Wall. You know, the wilderness Great Wall. Fantastic. So I think you know these names mean we. It's the wild, original, traditional um, story of China and the wall that we want to share with our friends and, and, and clients. Um, that's absolutely the case with me. Um, the good thing about the Great Wall of China is it's so immense that the approach to conservation need not be the same in each area. I think when um, a visitor sees experiences a section of wild wall which you know, maybe some of the viewers are they've never been to wild wall but wild wall is it has bushes on top because you know that we're talking about a wall that's not functioned as a military defense for more than 400 years so nature has claimed it it's become wild there are bushes there have been earth tremors there's been lightning strikes heavy rain freeze thaw action so it's it's in a state of ruins uh which is very romantic and charming and you know the, the, there is this constant debate should it be renovated should it be rebuilt and you know what i increasingly say is well it's a little bit like the gray hair and the wrinkles you know i wouldn't want to look a 20 year old when i'm 60 you know i'm 60 and that's it okay so I think uh, there need to be, of course, some sections of the Great Wall uh, rebuilt, stabilized for mass tourism. But I believe most of the wall should be left in a wild state. Um, and well, now there are what we can call intermediate measures the year on year now in the beijing area which is a wall rich uh region um it has yeah. uh almost 300 miles wall in an area the size of the state of new jersey for example there's always you know one or two kilo one or two miles of great wall renovation going on every year this is government policy now but the, the, the work is not rebuilding, it's stabilizing. Mm. It's minimal intervention. So, you know, you can imagine the archways yeah. uh, and the, the keystone, the key brick is missing. So they will replace the key brick there. Mm. They do strip off the vegetation, which, um, you know, I, when you see the really striking pictures, photographs of the wall, I think it's those wild areas that really excite people mm, yeah. um but you know this this is considered an, a rather extreme view of conservation um but i i think conservation should be um it should be a compromise in the the present and the future i mean what's been lost in the past we can't bring that back but uh, I think to prohibit people from going to wild war uh, would be a great tragedy because I believe the future of conservation comes from appreciation and appreciation comes from experience. Yeah. You are seeing you. Um, I probably haven't answered. 
No, no, no. I, I, I you are literally <laughs> playing, playing music to my ears. Uh, I, I fundamentally believe any conservation, you've got to make connection with the modern day uh, people. And if they can appreciate it, bring them into great world. If they can appreciate it, then they will be more vested to protect it, right? And so that brings me to the next question that I've, one of my dream, I'm not as vested in the law as you are, but still one of my dream is to have a hiking path that connects with lodges to stay and that connects the great law that allows people to say, this is our national hike. Uh, sort of like in the UK, you have the Southwest uh, Coast Path, something like that, right? Do you think that's possible? Yes. What, what, what are the barriers preventing that from happening? It's, it's a question that's been in my mind really since I made my journey along the wall on Fort um, 32 years ago. And uh, it's the concept of the Great Wall Trail uh to me an absolute no-brainer especially in the beijing area uh, a great wall trail um and i think it would be a great conservation step forward um i think the the experience of the wall is not just to be on the wall itself uh it's to be beside the wall in, literally in the shadow of the wall and you look up craning your neck because you know 15 20 feet above you are the battlements and also as you snake up the mountain towards the wall and in the valley so to be in wall country is a beautiful experience mm. and as chinese society especially close to the big cities like beijing 23 million people it's changed so immensely in the last 20 years. People have become wealthy. There's a middle class there. It's a huge car market. The roads are superb. There is leisure time. There's state holidays. There's personal holiday time. People have moved past this era of going to a place, getting off a bus, car, buying a ticket, going in, looking, 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 looking. Uh, they want to move. Uh, the the white collar workers, you know, they're sitting in front of devices the whole week. Come the weekend, come the holidays, they want to move. The trail concept on the Great Wall has a bright future. And I have spoken to local government officials about Great Wall trails uh, twice in the last year. Uh, and I believe in the next three to five years, we will have short strands of Great Wall Trails emerging in China, for sure. Uh, as for the whole national trail, like, you know, the Pacific Coast Trail or the Appalachian uh, Trail, uh, that's probably a couple of decades away. You know, the government officials often say, well, you know, the, the ownership in, in China is difficult. But in Britain, we, we created a Hadrian's Wall National Trail. You know, we have the Roman Wall in the north of England. And that's one of my stepping stones to come to China. I ran it in 1984 when there was no national trail. There is a national trail now. You buy a map, you buy a guidebook. There are signs along the way. There are stages. There are baggage transportation companies and, you know, the full works. Um, and many, you know, land ownership problems have been overcome. Uh, farmers, the National Trust, English Heritage, who manage, you know, sites of um, uh, antiquarian interest. They've all come together because they've all understood that this is beyond, you know, being in my sheep field. This is a national monument and it's a monument of international uh, it's a unesco world heritage and that has to be the concept that needs to be you know introduced to to to, to all the the stakeholders along the way yeah yeah i i can't wait Good question I, I thank you we get to see it in our lifetime and hike that trail 
Um, I'm I hope all so. the time. I, yes. I, I still have a lot of questions, but uh, I will go to a question submitted by Xiao Minghui from the University of London, because I think it's, um, it, it's an important yes. one. Uh, the question is, how do you interpret the concept of authenticity in the context of the Great Wall? And, and I would add to that question is, authenticity. what are the authentic ways to experience the Great Walls? For example, off the wall structure itself, authentic wall related lifestyle, brick making or whatever, where can yeah. we find that? Yeah, it's a very good question because, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the section of wall that was developed for tourism from the earliest stage is Bad Aling. And that began in the 50s uh, after the foundation of the People's Republic. I think uh, uh, a big Russian leader, uh, Soviet leader visited China and they didn't want the leader to you know, stumble and twist an ankle on, on the wall because it was all wild in those days. So they very hastily smoothed uh, like a hundred yards of, of wall. And then from then on, every national leader coming to China would go there and they extended it. And then tourism began and, and more of the wall became, um, uh, you know, rebuilt and sanitized. If you go to Badaling now, um, for me, it's, people are, are blindfolded from the real war because I know just over the hills, this way and that way, you can go to a section of wall and as you approach the wall, you uh, park your car in a village and the village has, you know, oh, that farmhouse looks as though it's 60 years old. And there are people, you know, plowing the field, planting and, you know, drying crops. And it seems old world. And these things are disappearing so fast. So I think the preservation of authenticity begins with an understanding, what is the Great War? And the Great War, I believe, is an historical landscape which has four components. The core is the wall itself. The second is the surroundings, the hillsides, the cliffs, the valleys, not only for their beauty, but because that is where the wall builders of yesteryear uh, were based. It's where they sourced all the building materials, they transported the materials up to the mountain ridge, and then they did the construction. So we, we've got the wall itself, the surroundings. The third component are the villages. Mm -hmm. Some of the villages close to the wall date from wall building times. And some of them even contain residents whose forebears migrated to that location four centuries ago to do the original building work. Uh, of course, these, these villages are rare with the, with the blood connection, as it were, but many of the villages have other Great Wall stories. For example, virtually every wallside village in the Beijing area has farmsteads built partly or completely of great wall bricks and these bricks were taken from the wall uh, we believe mainly in the 20th century um, and often in the 60s and, and 70s you know when 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 Mao Zedong said let the past serve the present so you know that's uh, an ugly episode of the wall's destruction, but a lot of history is ugly. It's nevertheless, it's an episode of history. So uh, to summarize, in my eyes, the wall landscape, it wall, the surroundings, the villages and the people. And if you can preserve as many of those elements as possible, then the experience is going to be more authentic. 
in the past, you know, Great Wall preservation was seen to be rebuild the wall, have a car park, ticket fence, you know, 20,000, 100,000 people a day, uh, you know, May Day holiday and National Day holiday. Now, as I've already said, society has changed. People don't want the crowds. After COVID, that's going to be even more so. We can, we can spread out. And I think, you know, the discerning traveler is going to be looking more and more for these elements that are slowly disappearing. But the good news is, uh, in the last six months especially, a lot of talk in the Great Wall community and in the NAD lines about the concept of a Great Wall National Park. So more than 50 locations of the Great Wall along its whole length have been identified as being of high importance. And also uh, the, the other uh, talk is about the Great Wall cultural belt. So I think this encompasses the villages and the people and their crafts and their way of life. But a lot of it has already gone, mm. really. Um, uh, you go to a lot of villages now in the Beijing area and those, you know, the vernacular architecture, the classic North China farmhouse with the carved wood windows mm -hmm. and the swinging big wood doors, they're few and far between. Now most of the buildings are the poured concrete and there's the rebar poking out of the roof ready to add the, the, the third story, you know, when there's more money. Um, and there are all kinds of conflicts like that. There are piles of bricks everywhere. You know, I always think, well, yeah, brick economy. Um, people invest in building because, you know, they're unsure if they're going to get, you know, I'm sorry, government policy, government project, this area is to be redeveloped, you move out. And the more space you're covering, the more stories you have, the more compensation you're going to get. So if the Great Wall cultural belt is to be a success, there needs to be, there needs to be study, there needs to be education, publicity, and there needs to be subsidy. Because you're not going to have people growing cabbages and corn beside the wall when they can be earning a thousand times more doing something else, you know, in the city down the road. But, you know, Green farming, organic, organic farming, niche products, uh, that can save the, the farming economy beside the wall. So you can see how broad and uh, diverse uh, studying the Great Wall is because it takes you down all of these side roads uh, yeah. that uh, are, they're all connected. And, you know, the Great Wall of 50 Objects was all about connecting the dots. Yeah, uh, I, I think we need another hour because I have a whole series of stories about <laughs> and your fa passion, the role of Wu Qi, uh, who, who is the unsung hero in, in your great oh, uh, adventure wife. and all that. Um, but I'm going to ask one a hard question. <laughs> it, it's an easy question, but it's hard. Right. What is your favorite section of the Great Wall? I get asked this all the time. When travelers coming from outside of China, they've never been to the Great Wall. They say, where should we go? That's one. Second follow up on that is for Beijing residents, if they want to have a day of outing, what's your favorite place to recommend for them to visit? Um, my favorite place is where uh, I have my house at the wall. Um, and it's called Jianko. Uh, it's a beautiful Great Wall landscape. And uh, although there have been threats over the last 25 years since we've been there, uh, so far the threats have um, materialized into nothing. And increasingly the local government uh, has realized that the real beauty of the area is the Great Wall landscape uh, perfected, uh, a magnificent wall, beautiful mountain scenery, uh, minimal encroachments of development, uh, villages beside the wall, 
uh, the traditional architecture is mainly gone uh, in, in most of the villages. There's just like um, one in 10 of the original buildings is, is there. Um, there are old people with, with, with stories. Uh, we've collected most of them. You mentioned my wife. She's, uh, of course, key in this uh, respect. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the honest answer. Uh, but I also love the extremely, extremely remote parts of the wall. And, you know, the wall, it's this umbrella term that includes walls from 14 or 15 dynasties. And way out west in the Gobi Desert, the Han Dynasty Wall, you know, that's the Silk Road. I find that awe-inspiring to think, you know, 2,100 years ago there were... Um, camel caravans of merchants that are carrying silk and precious goods from China in the protective lee of the wall. Um, and it's so desolate and so quiet now. Yeah. And even further afield, you know, out on the Mongolian steppe, uh, there are remi remains of walls that are just evident as a mound that you can barely see at uh, sunrise and sunset because of the shadow. And um, that, that also is one of my favorite places. Yeah, it, uh, I, I can just remember seeing those mounds of dirt out in the desert near Dufan. Absolutely. I, I think yeah. that association comes with age. Yes, exactly. And younger years, you like the picture perfect Great Wall. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we are unfortunately That's right, yeah. out of time, um, but I would encourage mm -hmm everybody to follow William Lindsay on Instagram. It's um, Wild Wall, right? And there are some other questions about why That's there right. are no yeah. books by Chinese about the Great Wall. And William, if you could address those on Instagram, I'm sure everyone would love that. And um, so, but we don't have time to hand, get to all of them, but thank you so much for, for chatting with us today. Um, we wish you uh, another year of wonderful explorations and influencing other people to um, experience the wall with you. And thank you all for joining us. I just want to uh, make a quick announcement for our March book club. We are reading the AI superpowers and the author, famous Li Kaifu Xianzheng, uh, Kaifu Li, will be joining us and it's already open for signing up on wildchina.com. And we have a couple of other events scheduled um, with roots and shoots and also another Taste of China event or going to, to the culinary school in Sutra and all of that. So thank you all for joining us and um, happy new year. This is our first event post the new year. So look forward to connecting more. William, say hi to Wu Qi for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank mate. you everybody.